if I'd just like to now introduce our speaker for this evening. So we're pleased to welcome Brett Townsley, who is the company director of Omniscient, I think I've said that right, Safety Innovations. And the tonight's presentation is titled Preventing Mental Health Harm in a Psychologically Safe Culture. So I, without further ado, I will hand over to Brett and the floor is yours. Thank you, Rachel. Um, thanks for the, the big build up. And to be fair, you weren't far off. So omniscient was, was pretty close. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to finally uh, be here. I know there's been a few rescheduling issues and difficulties um, um, to actually get the events uh, in place, but I'm, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to speak to everyone tonight about what is essentially what our business does in the workplace. Uh, my name is Brett Townsend, as I mentioned earlier, so a little bit about myself before I, I dive into the presentation. So I'm ex-armed forces, I spent time in um, the fleet air arm and intelligence exploitation, which was about uh, prisoner movement, interrogation, a little bit of, of human behaviour. Um, and then I spent some time in the oil and gas industry in the health and safety sector. So I am, much like everyone else in here, all about health, safety and risk. And that's what I'm going to look at tonight. Okay, let me just make sure I can do the share bit on this now. Uh, hopefully it's worked, folks. So hopefully you should have up the presentation there up in front of you, folks. Um, so I think before we dive into anything else, we have to be able to understand this essential um, uh, element. A person experiencing work-related stress, mental health difficulties, anxiety, depression, is not creating the hard time on the business. There's someone who's experiencing the hard time. And once we can start to take that ethos or, or um, the definition on board and understand it, that's how we can begin to build a psychologically safe workplace. And from a psychologically safe workplace, we can start to develop the tools, the mechanisms to actually prevent what is mental health harm in the workplace. Now, what I'd like to try and do is actually see if I can diagnose whether everyone in this room has mental health or not. So I'm going to ask you all to pop yourselves off mute quickly and I'm going to just simply ask you some questions and all I want you to do is respond to, the, to me with the answer and then at the end of it I'm going to try and predict where you all go. It's a little bit of a Jedi mind trick and if it goes well it's a tick in the box, if it doesn't hopefully no one will hold it against me anyway. Okay um, so hopefully I also invite you back after this regardless. So pop yourself off mute, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to answer simple questions. So what is one plus one? Out loud. Two. Two. What is two plus two? Four. 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 Gosh, I also got some smart cookies, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what is four plus four? Eight. Eight. Eight, eight plus eight? Sixteen. Sixteen. First vegetable that comes to your mind, say it out loud. Aubergine. Peas. Carrot. 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 Legends. <laughs> Who's my two legends there? Who are they? Is that Gordon Foot and somebody else, was it? Um, uh, sorry, Brett, it was. That's okay, Gordon. So, essentially, that's mental health. I've just diagnosed everyone in this room with having mental health. The process that happened to you in that moment was mental health at work. You simply thought, what are the answers? You had cognitive function, you had a psychological process. You felt something emotionally, at least I did. I'm hoping you guys felt something emotionally. I know Gordon did. You felt something emotionally and there was social interaction. Those three key elements combined define what is yours and my mental health. So every one of us has mental health and it happens moment to moment. It's not simply about having no mental health and becoming ill. It's a continuous cycle. And this is how we can recognize that actually we have a responsibility within the workplace because all of these things can be influenced or impacted by behaviors, uh, stressors, uh, heavy workloads, any of these root causes in and around the individual. And that's how you start to create what is essentially mental health harm. So it's not about the management necessarily of the illness, that's for the doctors and the 
clinical psychiatrists and psychologists to do. Us as health and safety professionals, as, as risk managers, it's our responsibility to identify the risk of this harm in the workplace and prevent it from happening. Typically, when we enter any social environment and we ask the simple question, how are you? The normal response is going to be, yep, thumbs up, I'm fine, I'm okay. And that type of environment or experience that you see most commonly in your workplace when you engage in those types of conversations is masking a deeper psychological issue that is going on within the workplace culture. The immediate response is a typical psychological response, but it's often hiding the fact that there's a multitude of different things happening underneath the surface. The I'm fine Ross response, yeah, totally fine, is probably not the reality of the authentic experience that the individual's having. So let's take into account within a 12 month period, the types of things that could potentially cause workplace mental health harm. Has anyone within this group in the last 12 months experienced poor supervision or lack of management support? If you're sitting behind the screen going, yeah, tick, then you're potentially someone who could experience mental health difficulties or mental health harm in your workplace. If you're someone who's experienced heavy workload pressures that go way above and beyond what is your roles and responsibilities, again, you are someone who could potentially be experiencing workplace difficulties. Um, if you're someone who has had um, financial difficulties in the last 12 months, if you're someone who has had problems in terms of reward and recognition within the workplace, again. But also, if you're someone who most recently has gone through a pandemic where we've been socially isolated for months at a time, and again, you're potentially someone who could be experiencing mental health harm or difficulty in terms of three uh, main uh, types of mental health that we could see, work with stress, depression, and anxiety. But the difficulty is the workplace culture doesn't allow or create the mechanisms that allow us to say, actually, I'm, I'm going to take a week off work because I'm stressed or this is causing me harm. What we tend to find is the normal, typical social reaction, which is, it's all good, I'm fine. So that creates a problem for us. Because if you have a workplace where everybody is fine and everybody is well 24 seven, and there is no one experiencing stress, then there's no reason to try and identify or prevent work related stress. Your business and organization is only going to start to work on something that they believe is a reality. So if everyone in the workplace says I'm fine and there is no stress, there is absolutely no justification to try and deal with what we know is work-related stress. And there's huge consequences to this in terms of poor workplace management. We start to see things such as presenteeism, absenteeism, accidents can be related to mental health difficulties, low productivity. There is a legal duty of care for people. And again, if we are not preventing and identifying what is mental health harm in the workplace, we're feeling that legal duty of care as well. And there's huge financial costs to this. Uh, absentee costs around about 6.8 billion. The presenteeism cost is estimated to be around about 26 to 29. These are significant financial numbers that are, in terms of our iceberg, the hidden consequences of that stigma and inability to have a truly psychologically safe workplace. The reason we have such difficulty with this is because of the way we approach mental health within our workplaces. We're fixated on the idea of well-being being the solution. Self-care is the way to promote mental health prevention or harm prevention within our workplaces, certainly at the moment. But the reality is very different to the approach we take. And the reality is that someone can have a clinical diagnosis of psychological injury or mental health harm in terms of work with distress, depression or anxiety while having exceptionally good mental health well-being. This is the uh, mental health continuum and if you look at this model you can see that in, uh, in the examples. So on your uh, top 
uh, north, south, east, west. If you look at the top there, we've got excellent level of well-being. On the bottom, poor level well-being. And then either side is clinical or no diagnosis. We know that people can be diagnosed with mental health uh, illnesses or conditions while having exceptionally high levels of well-being. So our self-care side, doing all of our five elements of, of well-being and taking care of ourselves and self-reliance is one part, but we can still experience the root causes that cause psychological harm or, or mental health harm at work. So you exercise, you eat right, you participate in, in social activities, you do things for charity. Meanwhile, you still experience the pandemic, you still experience poor peer uh, support, you still experience lack of supervision at work, you still experience financial difficulties. And all of these things can contribute to mental health conditions or illnesses that can be experienced alongside well-being. And most of our organizations focus or are fixated on well-being as the solution. But well-being generates a thought process that says this is about self-reliance. And if you are not capable or not strong enough to rely solely on yourself, then this is your responsibility. When in actual fact, there are multiple causes that have been identified that could have been potentially prevented and therefore preventing the harm or injury. We're really good at this in terms of physical safety. You guys are all prime examples of this because you're all professionals who will be um, exceptional in your fields. And you'll be able to work within the organization to identify the potential of things that could injure somebody physically. We do all the time. We have formal risk assessments, we have policies, we have processes, we have mechanisms to identify the types of hazards and prevent them. So we can see this really well in terms of physical harm or illnesses, but we're not so attuned to seeing this in terms of mental health distress. We tend to dismiss or ignore or sometimes just don't recognize what mental health distress looks like. And we don't have any formal mechanisms within our workplaces to help us um, identify, reduce or prevent. And sometimes actually all the way back to hazard identification. Again, mental health continuum. A person can sit in the bracket of healthy. And again, this is someone who is depending on a particular um, individual their health will be um, recognized around that individual. So if you've got physical difficulties already, that's your health starting point. But it's someone who is in as healthy a state as possible in that moment. When someone moves into the experience, so again, if we're looking at physical harm here, if someone has um, participates in a specific, specific workplace operation and then experiences the injury, so the event happens, the uh, accident takes place, the person becomes injured, so that initial blow, now they feel the initial pain, and then potentially moving on to whether it's a formal diagnosis of a, a long-term injury or illness. Same process is applied for workplace mental health, but actually where we enter the process is that injured. It's very unlikely that we're going to have processes, systems, or solutions that are based around prevention, because the most typical type of support that we currently use or, or, or training mechanism is mental health first aid. In. And first aid is the application of support when somebody is experiencing the injury, just like physical aid. So we need to start to get better at building up the mechanisms and systems within our businesses that tell us the healthy and experiencing phases within uh, the continuum. It's not our job as a business to um, treat mental health illness. Again, employee assistance programs, elements such as those will be in place, occupational health and psychologists, doctors, diagnose and treat the illness. But as part of a greater system, we are there to identify when someone moves from healthy into experiencing and then on into injured or illness. And if your business doesn't have those mechanisms in place, and you have to start questioning why. We have them in place for uh, physical safety. 
and again, diversity and inclusion, what we really want to do is have uh, an inclusive, uh, systemic approach to mental health, something that's truly sustainable, that recognises and treats physical safe, uh, safety and mental health safety in the same way. And again, that's the campaign that's being launched uh, next month or this month, I think it is, for the Mental Health Foundation, Mental Health Awareness um, uh, Day, around treating physical health and mental health health at mental health at work in the same way. So why do we need to do it? Well, there are regulations in place, but the population of the UK is stressed. We have a 74% of our, our workforce in the last 12 months who have declared that they have some form of work-related stress, depression, or a sense of being overwhelmed at work. With suicide rates massively increasing in the UK and suicide rates in Scotland round about two per day, which is um, astronomical, and the, the World Health Organization estimating that clinical depression will be the leading uh, cause of morbidity and uh, mortality globally, there's a recognized need to start to prevent rather than react to simply symptoms of mental health illness. So the data tells us there's a huge problem in our workplaces. Our HSE stats reflect that. Our uh, 17.9 million lost work days reported for work-related stress, depression, and anxiety. 51% of all of those lost work days reported were mental health issues, not physical safety issues. So again, we know the stats tell us that there's a problem there, but also there's a legal duty. So work-related stress is defined by the Health and Safety Executive as the adverse reaction people have to excessive pressures or types of demands that are placed on them. So the quiet quitting um, phenomenon that we're currently seeing is people simply stopping doing all of those excessive elements uh, throughout the job, the, the expectations that are not part of their roles and responsibilities. So, so there is a recognition that you cannot simply expect people to go above and beyond without looking at the jeopardy or harm, the risk that this creates in your workplace. And there is a legal duty to do this. We will all know the Health and Safety Executive also says that we have to prevent harm or, or the, the, the elements that can cause any form of harm. Again, mental health harm falls into this bracket. So there's a legal requirement, there is a financial and moral requirement, and there's a health requirement. And the HSE has a three-step plan that they want to promote to approach this. And it's, it's three simple elements. It's simply to evaluate, to understand what is mental health harm in your workplace, what's the reality or the authentic experience of your workforce, not the fine fine, what's really going on, explore, start to look at the elements within that, the potential of where these uh, root causes or contributing factors towards mental health harm come from, and look at how we create that psychologically safe work environment, and then develop your approach to it. How do you intend, once we have recognized and identified these key areas, how do you intend now prevent the harm and create a psychologically safe environment where people can speak up about these things without fear of recrimination. Now, the difficulty is, what do we do now? So we have the regulations, we have the knowledge, we know the data tells us people are experiencing these things. We know that the risk is there because we have employee assistance programs, which is part of a formal risk assessment. There is a risk people need mental health support, physical support. We create the employee assistance program, but we have a huge gap between understanding that and now attaching that to prevent harm and not applying simply the mechanisms to treat once somebody becomes impacted. There's a real specific reason why this is not easily done within your workplace. And it's something known as the chameleon effect. When we interact in social environments, predominant types of behaviours become normalised, um, much like safety risks. 
So when somebody interacts with us in the workplace and says, how are you today? The typical response is, I am fine. Everything is good. I can deal with all of this pressure, even though that might not be the reality, because we try to reflect back what is the most acceptable, normalized types of behavior. And it's something known as the Damien effect. And really what it means is you get up in the morning, you plaster on that camouflage, you deny everything that's happening in the background, you go to work and you say everything is fine, when there are much deeper psychological consequences of this belief going on. And we know that we're all going to experience them because we just diagnosed that we all have mental health at the very start. So we're all experiencing mental health. There is a tipping point where people will move over into mental health conditions, illnesses, or experience the difficulties from mental health harm, but we know we're all experiencing mental health. So we have something here in, in my business known as Camellia, which is essentially a cultural shift that allows us to recognize mental health in the workplace and change the language and embed systemic approaches around a more sustainable solution, a preventative solution. So not a latter half treat solution, but a complete solution that goes from top to bottom within the organization. It starts to identify those root causes, just like the HSE requirements say, explore the areas, um, uh, gather in real data that tells us what is the authentic experience within your workplace, and then manage those authentic experiences. And it's a culture of prevention. And it's simply about breaking down that chameleon social barriers that we have, that, that chameleon effect. We've got some tools that we use to do this, and this is just a quick uh, overview of what that looks like. So identifying factors, what are the workplace stressors? How do they uh, occur in our workplace? What creates them? The types of impacts that people experience. If I, um, if I had everyone in this room lined up against a wall and I, I threw a brick at everyone, essentially we're all going to experience that slightly differently. The impact will be different. How hard was it thrown? Um, which point did it hit at? Where did it land? These types of things. But also it's going to determine on how you react to it. So what are those outcomes? Is this someone who's now experiencing psychological harm and who has an injury or someone who has uh, developed a condition, short-term experience of mental health, or someone who's now developing uh, a diagnosable mental health illness? We use the hierarchy of control to then look at how we control or prevent each of these. Is it something we can eliminate within the workplace? If it's not, is it something we can substitute? If not, again, can we reduce the impact on the individual? If not, can we build the individual up to fortify their mental health resilience? And then finally, treat. We can't do anything about this if someone is now experiencing these difficulties, can we move them into the right type of support, whether that be first aiding, whether that be at psychological services, GP, but we can determine that through the system. And then also looking at where those realms of responsibilities lie. Is this something that the business should be managing in terms of something that can be uh, prevented, a, a risk factor, or is this something that is about self-reliance and capability of self-care? And can we build up your workforce to be able to deal with those impacts? So either side of the impact and not simply relying on the individual to, to deal with the impact to self-reliance. We have a system where we build up advocate profiles. So we can build up a, 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 an advocate profile for each individual within the workplace and, and enable that individual to start to do essentially psychological um, or psychosocial risk assessment and maintain that uh, pattern to understand whether the individual is starting to experience the harm or not. And doing this, what we begin to build up is a proactive, preventative approach to mental health. A real culture shift in the, the drive around what mental health is at work, enabling people to actively step forward and say, actually, this is not good. Uh, there is a risk here. We're creating psychological risk or we're creating uh, hazards within our workplace for mental health. And this is how we're doing it. And the benefits of that we can see in terms of return of investment. So reactive mental health um, 
from the Mental Health Foundation. Uh, they say, two to one return, proactive mental health, roundabout by point. This is where you support in terms of things such as mental health first aiding, general mental health awareness. And then finally, organizational wide culture around it, the preventative approach is round about 11 to one in return of investment. So it's profitable to look after your people. It's profitable to prevent the harm happening in the workplace. But in order to do that, we need to understand if the workplace or the workforce is being affected and in which ways. And until we break down the chameleon effect, we're not going to have the real information or real data to understand what that looks like because people cannot come forward and talk about it. So our goal to make mental health um, within the workplace uh, safer and make safer environments, safer culture, and we want to do that one chameleon at a time. Just changing that chameleon outlook and opening up so that people can come forward and talk about it. And that's our approach. We currently work with a group of organisations within the energy sector. We're always looking to partner with more organisations to get involved with. IOSH is, is another uh, great body that we're delighted to come along and talk to about it. But we're always keen to look at ways that we can embed a community culture into organisations and help them develop that and improve their workplace safety. That's it for me. Um, hopefully, that's given you a little bit of insight into what is essentially um, mental health harm prevention at work and the psychologically safe workplace culture. Um, psychosocial, psychological safety risk assessment is part of how we approach this. But in order to do that, you have to first of all identify, evaluate, and recognize the issue in your workplace and then begin to embed these systems. That's it for me. Any questions, I'm delighted to um, reply, respond in any which way I can. And um, that's our phone number and my contact details there on the screen as well as any of you like to get in touch and have a chat about it. Um, look forward to questions. Rachel? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for a, a very interesting um, presentation there, Brett. Lots lots to get the, the grey matter thinking about. Um, so I'm just having a quick look the questions, we've got a couple of questions coming through. Um, so the first one from, from Andy, what advice would you give us, give to us as health and safety professionals that we can take away from today and try to in introduce tomorrow in the workplace? Um, yeah, great, great question. So I think the, the reality is if you, um, if you can walk into your workplace tomorrow and ask people how they are, and you, you get the very uh, stereotypical responses of I'm fine, I think change the conversation. Uh, so, you know, if I walk in in the morning and say, how's everyone today? And everybody says, fine. I can instantly say, well, is that the reality? You know, has anyone experienced X, Y, or Z? There was a study conducted um, 12 months ago, maybe 18 months ago on schools in Scotland. And they found that out of a class of 30, 29 children within a 12 month period will likely experience all of the types of, of root causes of mental health harm, financial difficulties, uh, parents separating, uh, poor, poor relationships within their, their schools, teacher difficulties. If you pick that up and transfer it into your workplace, it's the exact same scenario. They're, they're your children. So you're living those experiences. If you can open up your workplace to talk about those experiences a little bit more, you're beginning to build the blocks to say, these are the things that really cause difficulties in the environment. Okay, perfect. Now, anybody else can, can step forward and come on camera, or if you just want to put your microphone on and, and ask a question of Brett, that's, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, I've got another couple of questions coming through on the chat. So how can we encourage more people to begin to open up um, this particular person? I work in the construction environment and men particularly yeah. don't like to open up and discuss issues. It's difficult if you can recognise a problem but can't get someone to take that next step and, and open up. Uh, absolutely. So um, the, I, I come from a, a military background where the culture is not to talk about these things. So it's very much about, you know, man up and get on with it. So I, I, I fully understand that and I appreciate that. The reality is 
we talk about mental health when it's going wrong. We, we ask the question, um, hey, are you okay? Is everything all right? Once we see the signs, but really where we need to be is, are you okay? Way in advance of that. You need to be using communication skills to open up conversations around mental health in advance of what you believe to be the difficulties. Um, and that's what a truly psychologically safe workplace culture is about. If you can transfer from thinking about um, what is mental health illness, now I need to engage and ask the question to mental health is happening 24 seven. So the only way to recognize if Rachel is becoming unwell is if I engage with her when she's well and understand what the pattern is, then I'll see the changes. So we, we're still looking at it the wrong way around. We need to start engaging much, much earlier on and trying to then identify the changes in the individual's behaviour. Perfect, excellent. So we've got a question here from Martin. What if management are the stressor and not interested in the health of the wow. staff? There you go. Um, no, I think Martin's going to half answer his own question there. The reality of, of what we do is um, you, you have to have buy-in because um, if, you, if you engage with the workforce, and, and we do this regularly, so you know, mental health, you have a well-being policy. Right, Martin, it's about how you look after your mental health. What do you do to self-care, Martin? So instantly, what I'm encouraging Martin to do is not talk to me. I, I don't really want Martin to tell me the problems. I say it, Martin, talk to people, open up. But actually, this is about you, Martin. How do you cope with your own mental health? It's self-care, it's reliance, it's about you. So you have to change the language. And if the leadership don't get behind that, you are definitely going to encounter problems. Um, so I, I, again, more, I, I would I would say I, I recognise that, and I think that happens constantly. You have to try and change the language for the leadership uh, team or management team as well. Uh, most okay. most people approach mental health thinking mental health is about black and white. You're well, you're ill. There's a whole spectrum in between. And that's the area that you need to manage and you need to start to change that language to be able to do that. Perfect, thank you. So there's another question here, Brett. Um, I sometimes feel that organizers, organizations pay for people to attend mental health first aid courses who really aren't the best type of people to attend. How can an organization select the right people to attend rather than trying to fill the gap and simply tick a box. Yeah, uh, so, you know, mental health right now, it, while there is a, uh, a surge in people um, engaging with it and talking about it and awareness has definitely risen, the reality is organisations are ticking boxes at the moment and very much mental health first aid is the tick box solution. But first aid, like any type of aid, is about um, apply and support once somebody's injured. The skills that you use in mental health first aiding are about communication, um, uh, empathy, the skill to connect with people. I agree, we should be looking at who those people are. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example of this. Um, I've, I've done work for organizations where they've said to me, we trained lots of mental health first aiders, but we're still not getting the conversations. If you have individuals in those seats who are instantly creating an environment where people don't want to communicate, you're not going to break down those barriers of communicating. Effect. You're not going to bring that down. So you need to implement the right types of people and neurodiversity. Who are the types of personalities that can connect? Who are the roles that can connect? But also, can you build a system around those individuals to support them to be successful? If I train 20 mental health first aiders and I put them into an environment at 300 people and I say, go fix it, they go off and then one of them leaves their seat for two hours and I, as the manager, then say, Where, where's Rachel? She was supposed to be doing her job. She's, oh, she's away doing mental health first aiding. Well, that's not going to, that's going to fly with me. Rachel, come here. You can't be away from your desk. 
you've got to be here doing your job. Now, Rachel's stressed, you're under pressure, and nobody's getting mental health first saving. So you need to build a systemic approach that supports the success of it. You can't just launch into it in, in a tick box, which unfortunately is what we do at the moment. Okay, and Gordon's come in with a comment. Difficulties with behaviour and addressing these issues is hard enough in a UK workplace. Those that work internationally have to appraise themselves of different nations' culture and how they perceive mental health well-being within their world view. Uh, absolutely, uh, Gordon. You know, Gordon. I, I I know Gordon well, and he is he's a, he's on the money. Um, you know, cultural barriers, uh, specifically some of the industries that Gordon works in. You know, the maritime industry. Uh, the treatment of certain types of individuals or groups of people. But what we need to remember is mental health harm is about when you cause harm to someone in any way that affects mental health. So if you're looking at things such as diversity and inclusion for particular types of groups, again, let's say, Rachel, you are, I think, potentially the only lady in this session. So let's say everybody left this session and, and you were the only one who experienced difficulties. Is it because of your sex? Can we identify types of demographics that are experiencing difficulties that are associated with age, sex, um, religion, um, culture? And again, all of those things can be tied into mental health harm, which again, goes into your diversity and inclusion. Perfect. So Martin's asking, due to the enormous financial pressure on us all, do you think that staff will feel less likely to admit to mental health? Well, strangely enough, we're actually seeing more people uh, coming forward at the moment. We, we work with a couple of um, uh, clients that are um, within the oil and gas sector, uh, some, some fairly large organisations, big organisations. And um, they're actually seeing an increase in the amount of people who are reporting work-related stress, difficulties, uh, anxiety, depression, etc. I think the issue is they are not able to identify where it's coming from, and not all of the time do they do anything about it. Very often it is, oh, somebody's reported that they're having mental health difficulties, they've got stress, oh, okay. Well, tell them to go to bed and tomorrow it'll be okay. Oh, okay. Off they go, they go to bed, the next day they're still experiencing it, but it's ticked off. So I think it is increasing in terms of people starting to come forward. But if you want a, a, a real culture where people feel comfortable to talk about mental health, uh, you, you have to break down those, those initial barriers in terms of that, that psychological effect because people will have real difficulties in saying, as Martin's mentioned, I'm experiencing financial difficulty at the moment. We all pretty much are, we know that. But the reality is no one's gonna step forward in the workplace and go, by the way, I can't pay my bills tomorrow. Oh, mm -hmm. that's not the conversation starter. So again, it, it, it's down to breaking down that psychological barrier. Okay, and Sophie's put in a comment here so really interesting take on mental health risk to compare it to a safety risk assessment it's not always easy to see when someone is having a problem but often people will be flagging issues through general conversation and complaints before it's a major concern and she agrees that it can be difficult to get management buy-in when they just want the job done yeah uh, that's it and to be honest with you that's the reality of physical safety as well right you know the truth yeah. is, um, we have a risk assessment, we have a formal process in place. Um, right, we now need to stop the job and do X, Y, or Z. We want to get the job done. We've got to make, uh, we've got to meet legal requirements. We've got to meet clients' needs. So again, culturally, if your organisation has values and beliefs, and then it creates behaviours that challenge those cultural beliefs, cognitive dissonance. I, as a person, have difficulty with a business that tells me safety is first, people matter most, and then when the crunch comes and we're morally challenged or 
uh, there is a, a, a challenge placed on the company, they go, actually, Rachel, get the job done, do it quickly. It doesn't matter about that risk assessment, get rid of it, you know, let's crack on. And again, if your organization is doing that, it's affecting the behavior. So it's going to create its own type of mental difficulties for the workforce. They're going to have struggles justifying those types of behaviors against the values in the organization. So can your business be truthful? It's not safety first. It's safety first up to the point where we need to get this out to the client. And then the reality is we need to get it out to the client. But that's not what they're going to say in their values or beliefs, is it? OK, so an another question here. Where does a company draw the line between mental health and well-being caused as a result of issues in the workplace and of those caused during personal lives. You gave a great example about financial circumstances, which is probably affecting many in the cost of living crisis currently being experienced. Yeah, so it's, it's back to our, our risk. It's back to where is, where is the risk coming from? So, you know, um, someone approaches us in the workplace and says, I am... Um, really stressed out uh, with work, you know, there, there's so much going on, um, uh, this is a work issue. But actually what we find is, well, he's going through divorce, he is, um, you know, he's just moved house. Um, there are a multitude of, of external issues going on. Mm -hmm. And has the workplace done enough to identify and evaluate the potential causes within the workplace? So do I have a system in place that if, if somebody knocked on my door and said, uh, hold on, this person is off work because of, of work-related issues, do I have enough in place that I can go, well, actually, that's not the case. There has been no excessive pressure applied to them. Everything they do falls within the job's um, specification. Their roles and responsibilities are clearly defined for them. They have not reported any issues in terms of lack of supervision, management issues, but they are experiencing financial difficulties at home. They are experiencing a divorce. So what's probably happening in that case is external factors, mental health difficulties coming from those types of, of situations, and then work is the added on top, but work's probably not the root cause. And again, if you had this as a phys uh, physical risk, you would go back and, and, and investigate and you would identify those root causes and then figure out what to do. But you won't do it from a mental health perspective. If Rachel, and I'm sorry to keep throwing you under the bus, Rachel, but if Rachel okay. comes into work and uh, we, we don't train her, we don't supervise her, she is um, um, asked to do a multitude of things out with her normal day-to-day -day job and we apply excessive pressure. And Rachel, is so overwhelmed with that that she uh, walks in front of a forklift and gets hit by a forklift. We'll uh, investigate that accident and we'll go back and we'll say, oh, those were the root causes and that's how we fix it. But if the same thing happened to Rachel, but this time instead of being hit by the forklift, she's so overwhelmed, she can't come back to work and she ends up with clinical depression. We won't investigate, we won't figure out the root causes. And the same things that caused a physical accident will happen to the next person. So again, do we have a system in place that really helps us to identify those root causes and figure out what to do? Okay, so we've got a couple of last questions to ask. So, um, Brett, how did you get involved in this field of expertise? Do you have a personal story particularly coming from a military background? Well, well yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I have multiple friends who have experienced um, issues, difficulties through the armed forces. Uh, I have a five-year-old daughter who I do not want to enter into a workplace or work environment when she is 16, 17, 18. I don't know how early I can send her out to, to pay the bills, but um whatever age she can i don't want her to enter into a workplace where we think it is acceptable to injure her with psychological difficulties uh cause mental health harm to her and her unable to work again 
and the business going well, it was about you. You didn't self-care. And I don't think that's acceptable. Um, probably everyone in here has children or, or at least has family relatives and probably knows somebody who's experienced some form of mental health difficulties or maybe has done themselves. But the reality is, if it's being caused in your workplace, there's no justification for that. There is, a, there is no justification for it. We mm -hmm. can do it with physical safety. We should be able to do it with mental health safety. Um, so yeah, I've got personal reasons. I, um, I know of people who have uh, taken their own lives. I, I have friends who have had uh, difficulties in terms of mental health. And I've seen it not only in the armed forces, but also in the oil and gas sector. And it's, for me, it's not acceptable. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple more questions. So, does management agree? So, so, I think, so I'll read the question as it's written. Sure. Does management agree that there is a possibility that the workplace can be a source of mental health? So, I suppose how how often? What, what's yeah. your experience? When does management accept and agree that that can be a, a contributory factor, or or are we fighting against the tide there quite a lot? Well, I. I, I started this business when um, nobody was talking about mental health at work and yeah. um, every organization I went to would just simply go, well, that, it's, it's not our responsibility. We, you know, it's, again, it's self-care. It's about you're not mm -hmm. tough enough to deal with it. But that has changed slightly. And, and I think um, the HSE's legislation, the stress management regulations, um, other organizations stepping up and saying, actually, it's not acceptable. Uh, when I uh, I presented again a few years back in, in, in an event where there was a health and safety fairly senior representative there and I presented on the subject and, and the room kind of lit up and said actually yeah what's health and safety are you doing about this and the, the HSE chap said we know we've got to do something more about this so there is a shift and I think mm -hmm. all of that weight the same forces but it but it adds um substance to the argument that businesses need to take responsibility for this and what we're able to do now is using the data and the knowledge and expertise that we have is to to guide them there you know it's it, we, we don't enforce change on them we sort of hold organizations hand and sometimes it takes longer for a business to get to the point where they go i get it we're going to do something about this Okay. But it's part of the process. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Now, one final question from that came from Andy. Could you explain what his emotional connection was to an aubergine rather than a carrot? <laughs> well, well. so uh, here's the thing, right? Carrot is the most typical answer, Andy. I, I wish I had Jedi mind skills or uh, the reality is the most typical answer is carrot. But wherever you go doesn't mean anything more than that's your particular pattern and all we're really trying to say is you've all got your own pattern depending where you end up is where you'll normally go but if i see you go from aubergine andy to uh spaghetti bolognese let's say then i would be saying okay there's something going on with andy we need to interact with andy and do something to support him because uh Spaghetti bolognese is not even a vegetable, um, so that would be the big concern. Okay, well you've you've got him worried now, so that's good, good. That, that was the whole point. <laughs> that was the whole was premise of the yes. Simply to worry Andy. This was all contrived just to get him in a state of, of pure panic. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Tick box done. Tick box, yes. Excellent. Well, I think that that kind of wraps things up. We've we've had some brilliant questions there coming through following the the session. So thank you for, for the questions that have come forward. And thank you again, Brett, for, for agreeing to, to come and present and, and speak this evening when we finally managed to get the planets aligned and everybody in the same room at the same time. So we, we got there. So appreciate your uh, your patience with that. Yeah, um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Perfect, Brett. And so I'd also just like to thank those that have come along and listened to what Brett has had to say this evening. I'll show you from the comments that we've seen in the, the questions. Um, I think you've all very much in, enjoyed the session and I hope you've all taken something away from this evening's um, 
this evening's event and can take that back into your own workplaces and at least as Brett says you know start that one conversation and and see where it goes and, and take it from there so I just again like to thank everybody for coming along this evening and um, thank you Brett for, for being our speaker and if people can just keep an eye on our LinkedIn pages that's where we generally promote our up and coming events and we've got some more events planned for the next few months so just please keep an eye on our, our LinkedIn and our social media and that's where we'll we'll advertise that for you so with that I will wish you a very good and safe evening thank you folks <laughs>